Hey everybody, Chris Brown here on the Shockwave Murmur channel. I am joined by Arvind Narula, um, our guest. Uh, we're going to go over a case that I just did, hopefully get his thoughts, maybe everybody else's thoughts about how they would deal with this. Thanks, Arvind, for coming. How you doing, man? Of course. Thank you. I'm excited to hear yeah. about this. So this guy comes in, he's like 70 years old, he's got crushing chest pain, but he's a little inebriated, nobody really knows exactly. They get this EKG that you can see here, he's got these very subtle inferior changes as sometimes these people with maybe a subtotaled right or something do. He's got some some reciprocal depressions anteriorly, his chest pain is completely unrelenting and so we activate this as a, as a STEMI, even though I'm not entirely sure it's going to be that. He certainly have an acute coronary syndrome from my perspective and so, you know, we got to go with it because anybody who is inebriated and still having crushing chest pain, I'm wondering what's going on. I take this first picture and I'm like, Hi, do I just not know how to engage this artery? And so I keep trying and it's, it, I can get a halfway decent picture. I'm like, well, I can see it goes distally. And I don't know if there's just a bunch of thrombus in the beginning and my catheter is the wrong shape. Maybe it's not big enough. You know, we're from the wrist. We're using the jail or an R3, uh, an R4. Maybe I need an R5. I switch sides. I take this other picture. He's obviously got this osteal circ lesion, maybe some distal left main thing. But that right, I still haven't taken a great picture of it. And I don't think that circ is the culprit to this. It's not small, but it's not the dominant vessel. So I get a different guide and then a different guide. And this is what I get with my different guide. And I'm like, I don't, you know, this wire, I was able to free wire in to even get this guide to see. I think this is an AR2 or something mm -hmm. to make it reach. I don't know what your thoughts about guides and uh, acute coronary syndrome, right coronaries are. I don't know what you like, but I just sort of, I think I probably used four different guides. I was probably pretty frustrated at this point. This is like, oh yeah, um, obviously, obviously occluded. I, I don't even see anything right now. I, yeah, I know. But in the other pictures, you can kind of see some flow. And I was like, well, what's going on here? And I was like, well, I got to figure something out. It's like, well, let's just balloon it. And so I ballooned it with a little balloon. I still couldn't see much. It probably just recoiled back down. I was like, you know what? Let me just try and deliver a lithotripsy balloon. I got pretty good back wall support here. I'm just going to go do lithotripsy. And, you know, maybe this isn't that big of a vessel, but my wire's pretty far out there. And it didn't, it went out there as a big knuckle. And I was like, you know, I don't, I don't think there's, this must be bigger than I think it is kind of thing. And so I did my lithotripsy and then you see, I get pretty good expansion. I mean, this might be an NC now, but it looks pretty good. I think I probably took a three O or something. I'm thinking to myself, well, I got a high this in a minute. And then I still couldn't see anything. And so I went back with my lithotripsy balloon. Um, and this is what I get at the ostium. So I'd done lithotripsy in the distal proximal lesion. I still hadn't gotten the ostium, obviously pretty, pretty circumferential there. Got relief. All right. This is good. I'm pretty happy about this. I put an ibis in. I figure out where the actual ostium is. Um, there's a little bit of cranial on this, which you don't really want. Uh, and I do another balloon angioplasty bigger thing now that we've ibis And you see my wire is pretty far out there. But you can see how big this actually is, right? Wow. This is a different mag, of course, but it's much, you know, way bigger than I thought it was. Chris, we're mm -hmm. seeing this a lot. I mean, the, you know, these calcified vessels leading to acute coronary syndrome, it does not make things easy. No, it doesn't, right? And I, I mean, I was just sort of, you know, having to make half this up on the fly here because I'm thinking I couldn't see the distal vessel. You saw those first pictures, I could kind of see there was something distal. And this really was a lot more inferior than it was lateral. So I'm like, I don't think that circ is the culprit. But, you know, this could have easily just been, a, you know, some non-dominant vessel or something. But, I, you know, I sort of chased it because I got the sense from the beginning that it was something wasn't good. And you can see the how huge it is. And obviously he's got diffuse distal disease and, you know, we're not going to chase that right now, but, you know, I feel sort of fortunate that we had lithotripsy in this case. I, I don't know how this would have gone without it. Uh, that's my original picture. I don't know how this would have gone without it. Um, you know, simply because you, well, I guess let's look at my original picture. I mean, I have, you know, I have no idea what's going on here really. I mean, I can see it's subtotally occluded, but it's not thrombus and I can't get anything to really get in there because it's like osteally that bad. I got lucky that I was able to free wire it. I think I used a polymer wire. I probably used a Xion black. There's more acute coronary syndrome calcium uh, than we're, we used to have. And you, you can see that acute coronary syndrome is becoming increasingly common, right? It's going to make up the majority or is making up more and more of the majority of our um, PCIs. I think for good reason, probably. I think we're pretty good with medical therapy now. We're pretty excellent at, you know, we're pretty good at primary prevention. We're really good at risk stratification. We have CT calcium scores. We have CT coronary angiograms. Everybody's on statin therapy. People have Repatha. They have you know, the CPA, if you believe in it, they have all these other, we have all these tools. People are trying to be better metabolically. They have better diabetes control. 
all these things are really leading to a sort of an aging population that we see having acute coronary syndrome. And then of course, those people um, have more and more calcium as they age, which is pretty evident, right? And it doesn't discriminate by race and it doesn't discriminate male or female really, but it does discriminate by age. And as you age in the decades, it certainly becomes more complicated. And so, you know, the problem is kind of broad here. It's even, it's exactly what you said, which is, you know, we're seeing more of this. It's really hard to do from a technical standpoint, right? We have difficulty with expansion. We have a plaque that we have a hard time modifying. I couldn't see that vessel. Um, you know, of course, the usual stuff, we don't have decreased vascular compliance because of the calcium. But again, these patients are older, so they have more comorbidities, even if they're well managed, they're more frail because of it. Um, so, you know, they're more likely to have a complication anyway. So these become increasingly difficult cases. And so right now there are, I think, six or seven, I guess we can count on this slide, seven different ongoing real world registries that are trying to look at this. The US one only has 30 day follow up. The ones in Europe have longer follow up. Um, the number of cases that uh, were acute coronary syndrome in these registries are pretty high. I mean, a third or more in many of them. And I, I don't know how the Spain one got to be so high, but it, it's pretty high. And so we're going to get more and more data about this. And I think we're going to have a better understanding of what we're going to do. Um, but, you know, I think that what's important is that it, so far in, in our registries that about 20, almost 20,000 patients total, about a third of which, so about 6,000 have acute coronary syndrome, about 600 of them had a STEMI. I would sort of count mine as maybe in the 6,000. At first, I thought it was a STEMI, but it's kind of, you know, in between, although that right wasn't really open. Um, you can see that at least for now, we're having really, we have good outcomes. Um, you know, we have the ability to show that, that uh, the the in-hospital mortality rates, the other things are very in line with what was predicted, despite having increased complexity of these patients. So, you know, when you think about this, it's like, well, all comers for however many years in the United States for acute coronary syndrome, we expect that the complication rate, you know, is for NSTEMI is 3.8% or something. The complication rate for calcified patients in the subgroup of this that have received IVL um, is 3.55%. So that, to me, suggests that we're in the right we're trending in the right direction because we're taking more complicated patients, but we're getting just as good outcomes as we used to. So I think that's an important thing for us to remember, but this is still, a, it was a good case for me because, you know, I, I couldn't figure out where that was. It wasn't that easy for me to see it. Um, I don't think I wanted to, or would have liked to just wrote a sort of blind, frankly, in, in this situation. And I don't love doing atherectomy and people who have activated platelets anyway. And in this case, we kind of felt like they were having acute coronary syndrome the way his chest pain started. So I don't know what your yeah, thoughts his, on this are. How his have you distal, done this his distal but... system opened things up. That that wouldn't have been a good scenario if you, if no, you did wrote that. Yeah, yeah um, exactly. Chris, so. Chris, let me ask you this. This was kind of one of my fears coming out of fellowship. What if you're in a STEMI situation and your workhorse wire doesn't cross? What's kind of your algorithm in a STEMI, in ACS, to kind of yeah. maybe wire selection strategies? Because you do a lot of CTO. So how do you go through that process? So that's a good question. I actually have a case that we did not too recently, uh, not, not too long ago, actually, that was um, something like that. Workhorse wire wouldn't cross. We switched to a polymer wire. It was low gram tip polymer wire, Xi'an Black. It wasn't a Pilot 50, but it might as well have been a Whisper or Pilot 50. You call it whatever you want. And, you know, that will find its way behind a ruptured plaque. It, there's a good chance of that. And so you have to be prepared to say, well, look, I can't cross this with a workhorse. This person's having an extreme problem. I have a couple of choices. I can either try and cross this with a polymer wire and, you know, I could parallel wire. I could do some stuff that probably won't work. Or I can be prepared if I lift a little bit of the plaque to just do limited, limited anterograde submittimal tracking and reentry. And so that's what we do. Um, or that's what I did. And, you know, okay, so we, we did, you know, quote unquote, a star, a limited star for about an extra 10 millimeters compared to what he would have gotten stent wise maybe before. And we just had lifted the plaque. We couldn't get anything through it that was too calcified because of how calcified some of these acute coronary syndromes are. We lifted the plaque a little bit with our polymer wire. We said, you know what, we're just going to go to a Mongo. We're going to form a real tight loop. I'm going to give it a good push and it's going to hopefully pop back in, or we can ADR, you know, stingray or something if we need to, because we know his distal vessel was big and open. This isn't a CTO. Uh, it's a big plump target and it just pops right back in. I mean, and cause that's what the wire wants. It wants the path mm -hmm. of least resistance. And when you have a big open distal vessel, that's where it's going to go and it'll pop back in. But we escal I escalate through my sort of, routine CTO escalation 
which is a, a low gram tip load polymer wire. I do tell people frequently though, if they're not using a hydrophilically coated uh, spring coiled wire, so say you're using a Manamo, which has a hydrophobic tip, um, I, I tell people it's probably worth trying uh, an eyes and eye or a run through hypercoat just because they have a polymer coating all the way to, the, or sorry, a hydrophilic coating all the way to the tip. That hydrophobic coating on those wires, uh, in, in particular the, uh, the the workhorse ones, it's meant to give you really good feedback. It's not meant to be a great crossing wire. That's not its purpose, right? You know, it's it's meant for a seventy five percent soft plaque that you can just push the wire through, and it's meant to keep you out of bad places. Uh, and that's what the hydrophobicity is for. But that doesn't really jive well with the really calcified subtotally occluded vessels that we're seeing in some of these ACS patients. So that's just how I do it. I mean, there's other ways, but I, I think that that if you are consistent with your CTO or your complex coronary wire escalation scheme, um, that you're going to have the most success in a unpleasant situation uh, going through the same stuff because you're really familiar and used to it. And I think that repetition there is helpful. Yeah, same same for me. If I if I do end up escalating, and even if it's a hydrophilic wire, I will um, definitely confirm with Ivis kind of before I do really anything. That make sure I'm in the true loop yeah. and make sure you know really diligent about that because you know it's worth the extra step. Oh, 100 percent, hundred percent. And you know, in this case, I felt a little weird because we sort of guessed on the IVL size. I mean, we knew that, that we were going to be touching calcium regardless of the size of lithotripsy balloon we got in there because we couldn't see anything anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so, and we'd already used a little balloon and still couldn't see anything, but you know, we're sort of making stuff up on the fly here. We didn't really have the opportunity to sort of size our IVL balloon the way we some, we normally do now. So the whole thing is a little, little uneasy, but I'm glad it went well for him. So. Yeah, that's a tough case. That's, it's always a kind of a scary case when you don't see anything, you, you can't, you get, it gets frustrating. I mean, you, you definitely had, uh, you know, some diligence trying multiple guides and then I feel like sometimes you get lucky, but you take it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> those those are really lucky and good. Yeah, these are really <laughs> challenging cases. But exactly like you said, I feel like our patient population is just older and older. And then, you know, so many of these STEMIs, ACS cases, their patients are in their 80s, 90s. It's just, uh, it, it, and they get so much more challenging. So I'm glad the field is evolving with uh, different technologies as well to, to help kind of modify, you know, calcium and everything. I mean, I've never seen stents, you know, have such good expansion with, with all the tools we have in place um, after everything. Uh, and that so, I agree with. I think we're really giving people the best long-term outcomes with IVIS and with lithotripsy and with atherectomy and all the tools we have now. I think, you know, we're giving people stents that are, that are destined to do well. So I'm pretty happy about it. Mm -hmm. Thanks again for coming, man. I appreciate it. Of course. Thanks, Chris.